This week will go down in the history books. A VIX over 65, a flash crash, and of course, an absolute panic in the Japanese yen. But now that the markets are synchronized with each other, should we be paying attention here or should we be looking somewhere else? Well, as it turns out, every pullback bar one over the last five has had a very similar setup, a bear flag that has failed. Today, we discuss what's in store for these markets moving forward and why this chart could actually tell us so much more about what happens next. Also, Bitcoin rejects the level we talked about in the previous video. And for anyone that was following this week, oil reaches its first target. As it turns out, though, there could still be more to come for this one. Let's go through stocks, commodities and cryptos, guys, for the week ahead. This will be a great one. Let's get into it. Well, welcome back, everybody, to the special weekend edition of our daily show where we talk about markets together. And boy, oh boy, what a week that was. From Monday with our live stream together, finding that beautiful base on semiconductors to, of course, some amazing trades throughout the week, including a 61.8 pullback on the major indices. We are sure to be in volatility now all the way into the election. But what does this mean as we go forward? Well, if it's your first time here, remember to subscribe and smash that like button. But let's get into sentiment surveys because, of course, these can help us to define bottoms, especially if there is a maximum fear starting to come through. Well, as we suspected, although I called 38% plus, we saw the bears come back up to 375 Neutrality certainly dropped a lot, which was interesting. They all went to bearish and bulls still remained relatively solid. But whenever you're looking at these particular indicators, you want to be looking at an overall bull bear spread. And that returned back to where we were during the month of, of course, April and the lows that we saw at that point. Not quite to the extreme lows, though, that we had back in October of last year. And of course, what led us into basically a nice big buy at that point. There are other sentiment surveys as well coming out. This one from Charlie Bilio over on X. And it basically says here that we went from extreme bullish positioning, according to the Investor Intelligence Survey, 64.2% of people bullish sentiment. That is absolutely wild when you think about it, to the biggest crash, I believe, ever recorded, biggest two-week percentage drop since October of 1987. And guess what? That was literally the last big, massive flash crash that looked like this. So does this mean that we have just flushed out all the bulls? There is a decent chance. And of course, we'll look at the data to suggest that. But firstly, we need to say, is this market cheap? Well, not really. <laughs> I mean, we know it's not cheap and it probably won't get cheap during this AI bubble period, late cycle market that we're in. We've been talking a lot about that. And at the moment, we are trading, according to the JP Morgan latest 12-month PE figures, at around 20.2 on the Ford PE, which is above the five-year average of 19.4. So is it really expensive anymore? Well, no, not based on current earnings. And this earnings season, remember, has been mostly living up to expectations, at least for the biggest stocks. So let's now have a look at the PE ratios. Where are the cheapest sectors? Well, of course, that's always going to be in the energy market at 12.1. The financials still trading around 15, doing very, very nicely in the markets. And recently, we've seen real estate becoming one of the hottest sectors of the last month. It's actually been a bit of a sleeper. Most people don't know, but it has pretty much been the best performer now over that one and a half month period. S&P Ford 12-month PE ratios, Infotech came back to 27.4. That was trading almost in the 30 bracket. So of course, getting a little bit cheaper there. And again, you'll notice as we go through, most of the sectors are kind of being valued around 18 to 20. And then there's poor energy down here in the back, possibly now starting to look cheap as we find out that CTAs have started to buy what has become an incredibly oversold market. So with all of these kind of considerations, you know, especially when we know that this market is still technically overpriced by five-year averages, could we still see buyers come back in? Well, the thing is, yes, if you're talking about a bubble period, we are now not anywhere near still the tops of the dot-com or, of course, the 1929 periods. And this is an interesting chart because a lot of people say, well, we're in an extreme bubble, everything's ridiculous. Remember, things can get more ridiculous. And this is where you need to really keep a level head should it happen over the next one year, as we suspect it could, especially if the Fed does rate cuts and everything holds true over that period. 
Remember what we're looking for guys is that we're looking for a market where everyone says we've fixed everything, we can never crash again and don't worry about valuations. If you go back to 2021, we were all lauding companies that made no money, that had no chance of making any money, yet we were all buying them. So remember, things can get ridiculous even in this world of technology, AI, and everything else. It also brings up the question of whether the market has structure leading into a recession right now. And we shared this in our last video. We talked about it. So definitely check that out after watching this one if you're interested. And what it said basically was that market structure usually wouldn't be finding its way up and instead would have already been kind of rolling over a little bit or going sideways, effectively in a chopping market where it's going up, down, and all around. Now, if you know anything about 2024 so far, it's been pretty bullish with the standard two pullbacks, and the GDP is still forecast to be bullish. According to Goldman Sachs' latest report here from Mike Zaccardi, he's saying that basically, yeah, we're going to still have a positive GDP. Now, that's not usually what you see with recession. You could say, well, these are fake figures. Everything's a bit fake here. And we know, especially with non-farm payrolls, the jobs numbers do tend to be revised up, down, and sideways, usually losing about 10 to 25% of the jobs over the next revision. But overall, this is not what we really need to think about. We need to say, okay, well, what does the data suggest? What is the price action doing? And as we talk about in this channel, number one, TA, number two, data, and of course, number three, flows. We want to understand where those are at so we can make better decisions. It's now expected that we're going to get a 12-month 191 basis point cut, but the speed at which these cuts happen will be important. And here's a great chart from Charlie Billio again saying 50 basis points or 25 basis points. Now, it is expected, according to some Bloomberg articles and some rumors that are going out there, that we're only going to get a 25 basis point cut in September. And I think this is very important. If we get a 50 basis point cut, doesn't tend to have a great stat with it, especially in recent times. In fact, usually a 50 basis point cut is a freak out. Now, there were some people this week literally calling for a 75 basis point cut and then another 75 basis point cut. That is, that is really drastic. That is like full on crash material type of thing. So we do want, if you are a bull in this market, a 25 basis point cut. If you're a bear, you probably want to see a 50 basis point cut and if they do a second 50 basis point cut, things are going to get pretty wild. At the moment, the general consensus is still 25 basis point cut increments. And this puts us into a perspective of maybe looking back into 2018-19 period, which we will do in our next video if we manage to get two out this weekend to discuss it. Because there is just so much going on that I thought it would be good for us to talk about that in a separate video itself. So what about rate cuts? Do they have, you know... In interesting negative correlations. Everyone's saying a rate cut's going to be negative towards the market. Some people are saying rate cut is positive towards the market. Well, what you might notice is there is a difference between how the market reacts afterwards. And there are a lot of cases of no recession in 12 months. But again, rate cuts generally do end in recessions. And the main reason why that is, is because we get yield uninversion un of the yield curve. So remember the bonds market is often inverted. At the moment, we are still inverted and we saw for a fraction of a moment this week together, actually live here on the Monday show, join us for the next Monday as well. It's going to be absolutely wild, I think, in the market moving forward. So some great opportunities there. But overall, this is the thing. We're still uninverted or inverted at this point, And eventually we will uninvert, probably signaling that we're going into a recession. But in most cases, we still do get bullish favorability from the markets after a rate cut themselves. And this is kind of the way it looks. As long as we don't get a recession over the first 12 months, most of the time the markets will go up. They'll get uh, very, very volatile coming into the event themselves one to two months out, which is what we've talked about many, many times before. Then one month after, they can have a little bit more volatility and then they'll disconnect from each other. And it's this disconnect that we're most likely looking at later on this year coming into the election that will tell us a lot about what's going on in this market. Are we actually going into recession? Has the market structure told, started to tell us that? And can we figure it out using some of our other lead indicators on the charts? Otherwise, it could be still all green, all good, list, pretty much running by things like the Whaley Brett Thrust and other stuff. These are the stats that we've talked about. It's normal to see 8 to 7% pullbacks. That's exactly what we got this week, an 8% pullback on the S&P. Of course, more 
in the bubble sector, which is the NASDAQ and the AI sector. And we saw some absolutely wild stats when it comes to percentages of puts and um, out of the money kind of puts and everything like that. So the cost of out of the money puts went through the roof this week and is starting to stabilize. Obviously, it's come back down here, but you can see the spike of the cost of puts. Now, if you were owning a put on Monday, and you close that, even if the market had gone down another 1% or 2%, because the VIX was over 65, you would have been making some great money. And I did get asked this question a lot this week, which was, I have a call, and it was worth, even though the market didn't drop the day after I had it on Monday, I ended up losing money. Yeah, that's because the VIX is coming off. You're getting that implied volatility drop off. And look, if you were a premium seller on Monday, congrats to you. It certainly was an excellent day to do so. If you also could get, though, the liquidity in because it was quite difficult. VIX intraday range is now, I believe, the highest on record. And you can see here just how wild it is, even based on the ones that we saw in 2020, in 2019, and even all the way back to 1999 during the kind of flash crash and sell-off that happened there as well. So this was one of well the biggest event ever in terms of massive movements of the VIX. And it led us into an interesting phenomenon. I thought we could discuss this. And this is an inverted term structure on the VIX. And this can signal a short-term buy opportunity for stocks when it reverses. Specifically, when the VIX, which is trading above the three-month VIX, closes back below it. So effectively, it switches around. Now, this happened on the 8th of August. And it generally brings us into around one week of buy signal. Now, that will become important when we have a look at that bear flag concept, because remember, we mentioned the idea of nine days. Now, we'll go through that in a moment. But yeah, the VIX literally inverted, uninverted, and this is very rare. And of course, what it now has brought up is that at the moment, everyone's trying to buy call VIX calls. Now, if you were in it earlier, if you expected volatility, which of course we did, we expected some vol, no, nowhere near as much as this. We kind of expected the VIX to get to 20, maybe 25 then that's all good. But when you're buying VIX in an environment like this, that is incredibly risky. And you'll notice that everyone's trying to strike off VIX 20, 21, 22, 25. Yes, it's in a little bit of positive gamma at this point, but generally speaking, VIX can get very expensive for your portfolio quickly. So be careful there. When we see these types of incredible volatility events as well, what do we know? Well, we know that generally it's positive. So the stats again, pointing towards buying the dip at least initially and generally flash crashes the way they play out have been technically bullish over time it can warn of other problems but again if it doesn't become systemic it usually stops pretty quickly these are the big earnings this week a couple of big ones mostly chinese stocks are coming out i think baba tencent these will be watched of course i have been watching tencent very closely and we'll look at that chart later on if this does well it could be the beginning of a Very nice run on the Chinese stock market. So we'll be watching that. And in terms of the options market and what's expected there, you'll notice that Baba is expected to move plus minus 8%. So again, you know, every one of these earnings announcements nowadays from big tech companies is is slated to move possibly $100 billion in one session. It's absolutely wild when you think about it, but that's the type of volatility that we've expected and will continue to expect now over the next one year in earnings season. Every earnings season is blockbuster stuff. So make sure to subscribe to the channel because we do cover the major earnings announcements as well. Now let's go over to dark pool liquidity. We've started to see what looks like potential buys here in one of the bull 3X S&P 500 funds. Now we've previously seen some what must be sales and of course sales over here that have led to the market going down. So it tends to be that when we've seen these particular positions, they have led over the next kind of couple of weeks or couple of days into that position kind of being profitable. In this case, we got the largest trade that we have seen in pretty much two years on this particular position happening right around this drop off here. As it dropped through that session coming back to the 61.8 FIB, we saw one of the largest trades ever. Now, it is possible that it's something else that isn't an entry point. But then we saw two other points here right on the breach or the area where we were starting to break out from that gap fill zone. So this is pretty important, certainly one to watch and to keep in mind. Another was treasuries. We saw this print come through as well, which is a print basically at the high. This was someone, it turns out, taking profit on TLT. 
and now the market has fallen back. Now, if you have a long-term perspective on treasuries, which we'll talk about in a moment, 12 to 18 months, it's probably going to be good. But do remember, treasuries are usually short-lived unless you have a longer-term approach. So treasuries are great in portfolios. Someone like Warren Buffett, he's holding massive amounts of treasuries, but at the same time, it's not really a uh, fun trade that tends to happen quickly. The Whaley Brett Thrust, I thought we'd keep bringing this up. We triggered this about three weeks ago now. We usually expect two to three weeks of weakness. Then it starts to improve, and this is exactly what we're starting to see. Remember, the thing with the Whaley Brett Thrust is it has 100% track record over the last couple of years, and we've shared that plenty of times in our previous videos. Some very good bullish stats over the next six months. Let's now take a look at the rotations in the market, the sectors, which sectors were doing well. Well, as it turns out, we've got things like REITs doing well, which is totally weird. And then we've also got gold. We've got a bit of defensives on Friday, but XLRE continues to go from strength to strength to strength. And you can see here over the last five days where we were weak in semiconductors, we've now managed to eke out a positive event. And this is exactly what we were talking about on the channel. We've been big proponents of NVIDIA really anywhere since 108 down to about 92 because, of course, we saw several different interesting buy zones. The most notable in NVIDIA, of course, was the 95 gap. Very key zone. And on semiconductors, the 200. Now, why is this? Well, it's because what's brought us into this bubble, what's brought us into this point here in markets has been the AI stocks. And considering the fall off, what has to get us out? Generally, the gamma stocks will go first. So it makes sense that if we're going to get to a new all-time high in markets, we've got to see these semis start to improve. And even though the negative sentiment around them is bad, they have to improve. If they don't improve, then we're going to have a bit of problems in the markets, won't we? Uh, over the last five days, some other markets moving to up, down, all around. Of course, utilities was one of the best performers that's come off in recent days. And another one that I expect to improve coming into next week will be things like gold index. So certainly gold starting to show some signs of life. All right, well, let's discuss this idea of the last kind of five pullbacks. Most of them ended up in what we would think were going to be bearish flags. Now, they may not look like that when you're here on the weekly, but let's have a look at the actual daily chart because the daily chart will show you that a lot of people were setting these up as bear flags. And I've seen a lot of this on X. I've seen a lot of this on other social media platforms where everyone is saying, look, it's a bear flag similar to this one over here and the market's going down. Now, one of those worked out of all the previous sessions, but one thing is kind of unique about all these moves is they've tended to consolidate for around nine or 10 days. And of course, we are now in the day one, two, three, four, five. So that would suggest that we might grind up a little bit more here into possibly even the gap fell, creating what people will think is a bear flag, and then it could actually still explode out. A very interesting observation here on the markets and certainly something we need to be paying attention to. Remember with bear flags, it is important to realistically wait for them to actually trigger, that is sell off. If you're automatically just looking at a bear flag saying, wow, I'm gonna go into them, then you will usually lose. And I think the most notable one here was this one that was setting up as a bear flag back in April. And what I always like to say is I always like to say, it's better to have patience and react to the market and don't predict and that is where you actually saw this candle here. What a great buy signal. Helped us to get that base at that point. If you had dry powder, if you were ready to pull the trigger on the markets, that is an excellent buy zone. Uh, whereas, of course, a lot of people will have tried to sell off at this area here. And they would have been stopped out or even worse, getting squeezed to the upside. So right now, where are we? We're basically chopping up, slowly melting up, slowly recovering. And one of the most notable lines that you want to have on your charts this week is around 5440, something we've talked about before. A gap fill on the S&P 500 and the 20 daily moving average, the mean reversion. Very standard for the market to come up to these points and often find rejections. So although it also acts as dynamic support, it can act as dynamic resistance, which we've already seen once. It's going to be a big level, and it is certainly one we want to be watching. Let's move over to the futures. How did they trade? Well, they kind of just sat around. It was a very boring end of the week, while the market pretty much consolidated, and I would like to think made as much money as possible from options, from us as traders, because, yeah, there were quite a lot of expirations happening right around this zone. 
And that meant that they made maximum profit, as in the Wall Street uh, riders. So they did pretty well. We got some good signs last week. We got a first time frame change of trend. We got a pullback to the 61.8 zone. We talked about this. We actually found this live during the session and just on the open. It was a great buy period. Specifically, it was fantastic around here. What a fantastic zone. Good little TP here as well, around a three to one ratio, if not a bit more. And then now we've actually consolidated. So at the moment, you'd have to go in favor of the slow grind up to 54.40. And some of the reasons why that is, is because when you look at the weekly, it does look pretty strong. I mean, it's a massive bullish hammer. You cannot disconnect from reality and say that doesn't look like a pin bar or a hammer. It's a pretty strong candle. And when you go through history, usually there's a little bit more to come from it. There's a little bullish hammer, it has a little bit more follow through. Of course, it did end up weakening. This one here went a little bit higher, weakened, pulled back, which we already did see a pullback in this pulled back, then it ended up going strong. Here's another one, ended up going strong. Again, 20 moving average. On this case, the weekly was actually dropping them. But these pin rejections, they do show someone was trying to buy it. Someone, I always say wicks hold orders. And one of the reasons we say that is because a wick shows excitement. At one point, the bear was in control and then something happened, something changed. It flipped the switch and boom, the bulls were coming back in big form and they were actually buying pretty decent volumes. Now, a lot of people have argued that, yes, the volume is dropping off. This is terrible, but I would encourage you to go through some of the other flash crash bottoms. And you'll notice that while volume dropping off is not ideal, I mean, sometimes, of course, volume does stay a little bit better. You'll notice even here, it does drop off. The steepness of the drop is probably the major concern. Here, you can see a flash crash, big volume drops off fairly quickly, and it still manages to consolidate and buy up. And if you go through 2018, 2015, 2000, every other period, you'll notice it's actually pretty consistent. So don't fall into the trap too much of thinking that the volume has to come with it. Remember, we use volume profiles. We use a lot of volume work, but it doesn't have to increase. It does should stay consistent though around this level. I would like to see it, of course, pick up a little bit or at least stop dropping off here because, yeah, you do want some action to come in. Of course you do. Let's move over to the options market now. What's in store for the positive and negative gamma side? Well, things have changed pretty, uh, quite a lot actually. 53.44, this 53.40 is a gamma switch zone. So effectively, we're going into a possible positive gamma as of Monday, the 12th of August. And we know here there are so many calls floating around that zone. So if the markets do resume and they find strength through the session, then there's a good chance that we could push to 54.40 throughout the start of the week. And you'll notice that we already have kind of where we think the put support's gonna be, which is 52.50 or 5200 flat. So positive gamma coming back into the markets as we cross through 53.40, and that will be important. For market traders that are looking at OPEX in the future, whether it's August OPEX or even September or OPEX, 5,300 does seem to be a pretty big put wall. So yeah, we've got positive gamma coming back in. And again, if the markets stay high and uh, strong throughout the Monday session into lunch and after, there's a good chance the markets will keep rallying and push up with that kind of eight to nine or even 10 day narrative, creating the bear flag, inverted commas, um, that we see on the charts. Uh, S&P, CTAs, as we suspected, we knew this was gonna happen. They've come back pretty big time. The nasty algos, they're back, they're buying, and you can see them picking it up. Now, this is delayed data, so of course, we know that we can see it on the charts here. They did buy the dip. There's clearly a buy here after becoming neutralized, and this is a good sign for people that are trying to find this as a bottom because the CTAs have bought at the neutral level, and they've started to pick back in. Some other ones that are really good, Brent, great trade there last week, fantastic, very replicable. Uh, we have had you know, some struggles. I mean, there was the copper trade that wasn't so good, but Brent totally paid out. Remember, ratio is really important in trading. If you're making two and a half to one and you lose one, let's say you lose on copper and then you win on Brent or you win on US oil, then this is a huge deal. Like, I mean, you're making two and a half to one, you've made back your money and some. So remember, trying to get a strategy that gives you good risk reward is very important. And a lot of the time, patent strategies won't give you that. Uh, so you need to figure out what I believe is position-based trading. Position-based trading, structure, TA, 
obviously flows and data can help you a lot to get better ratios in your trading and investment journey. Let's move over to gold. Gold it has found a little bit of buying pressure from the CTAs. It's still quite elevated, which is, of course, a bit struggle. And I'm also looking at silver here to find buyers. Great zone on silver, great charting. We've talked about it. We'll go through it again today. We do like that level. Let's move over to Tesla. Tesla is struggling around 200. No surprise that that is the major call zone. The thing about Tesla you can always be sure of is that retail traders always target usually a big round number. Uh, you'll even notice in the OPEX is coming up. You can see here September, everyone's gone 300. There's like 300 calls floating all over the place there. For the week ahead though, what have we got? We know that we could enter into positive gamma. In fact, it looks like we actually are now in positive gamma. And if we push a 200 to 205, I think it's 205, 210 narrative. So if we start pushing past those levels, it could create a very nice bounce for Tesla. And we'll look at it in the structure in a moment because if it does break through some key levels, we should get thrust. And that will be very nice for momentum based uh, positions. Nvidia is the same 111 here, though, which is a strange strike, but we're trading at 105. We're currently still in a negative gamma, negative GEX environment, but we could move into a positive one fairly quickly. And 110, 111 remains the most positive big bull level this week. And 100 remains the most uh, kind of like supportive zone. Central bank liquidity versus the S&P 500 now. How are they going? Well, the central banks are gutless. So they tend to support the market. You can see little upticks here in their liquidity over the week. That means they're supportive of the market while it's falling off. The VIX has dropped all the way back to 20.36. While it's above 20 or even 15, it generally is an elevated market. Anything can happen. Once we enter back into under 15 or under 18, some people say that means that we're in a bull market again and basically a, a more like consistent bull, slower moves, one to one and a half percent maybe dailies. What about the bonds options flows? Well, that's dropped off considered. Uh, so again, the freak out that everyone had at the start of the week seems to be dropping. We'll continue to watch that chart and yields themselves picked up. So from falling off a cliff to picking up around some of the key areas we thought they would, both the two-year and the 10-year are doing it. And remember, guys, always have the US 2Y versus US 10Y on your charts. This is yield uninversion. So this is what you're looking for. We kind of saw it. I deem that not to be uninversion because it didn't even hold a day underneath. It held a couple of seconds underneath, but it's bounced back up. So we're sitting at 1.029, very close to basically putting a timer on this economy. That signal has not really ever been wrong. Maybe once it's given a false. There are ways of making it 100% though in terms of reads, which we'll go through in the future, and we are watching it. Treasuries bounce off the most traded area. So we know that someone probably sold here. We know that there are a lot of long-term buys that are floating around this 95 zone. And if you're holding treasuries, you're looking for about 110 but I don't think it's going to be quick. It's going to take a while, maybe a year, maybe 18 months. It'll be a while till it gets there. Regional banks, home builders, all of the things that we often look for to see whether there's weakness in the markets. They're still all holding bullish structure on the dailies and weeklies and even the big banks. You can see here, they started to drop a little bit, but they held their supports and they bounced back up. There is a problem for the banks across the board. You'll notice that they've hit already the 61.8 almost on things like Goldman Sachs. But this is why around this level here is going to pretty much mark in 54.40 on the S&P. And that is going to be the most critical point. If the markets bust off there and they're not able to regain it, if they regain it, new all-time highs, I'd say. But if they bust off here and they start falling off, that could still be the major concern for market traders. So there are some good bear zones coming up as well. Keep that one on your XLF and you'll notice it'll sync up with the S&P. I'd be pretty sure on that one. US dollar, what's it doing? Nothing. <laughs> it's so boring. <laughs> US dollars dropped, it fell, it's recovering. We still expect it to possibly get to 105 to 108 and around there we'll be looking for a reshort on the dollar. Copper came up to the key zone, unable to break it. That's why we have the key zones. We do want to see bullishness in copper again if we're going to go super bullish in markets. Again, daily rejected. We now can move this up a little bit above the wick and we will have, I believe, a decent trade on copper moving forward. So I'm going to keep watching it. Uh, nothing to do yet. What about gold? Good bounce off the lows here. You'll notice that the weekly closes pretty well. 
If you're a day trader, you may have liked what you saw here on the previous session on Thursday. Friday was boring, uh, and now we'll see whether we continue to move up. As you know, if you've been watching the channel for a while, I got a call on 3K on gold from a long time ago, and I still think that that can happen. We're down to around 12 to 16 months or something like that until it, I expect it to occur. But basically, yeah, it's bullish on gold, series of higher highs and higher lows. We do want to break 24 85 to really see a lot more thrust come in. What about silver? Again, looking pretty good. Silver actually touched our major bull zone, found some buyers, consolidated in this area, hasn't breached out. I think momentum traders will be looking for a breach above here now this week. And that's about 27, kind of 65, 70 zone. And if we get through there, we could easily be moving up to 2850 very quickly. So I think there's a replication trade here on silver. I'd like to see that thing find some buyers. US oil, I'll give you guys a clap. Well done. You did good. And this was a very good replication trade. If you're ever interested in finding out how to get something like this and you know replicate it, we do have it in our day trading masterclass course. We obviously talked about this live, but at the same point, this is replicable. And more importantly, it gives you well over a two to one ratio from your risk reward. So yeah, it's hit the target that we had. Now, because we know CTAs though are getting involved again, this is could be just the beginning of the bottom here for oil. So we have to look at the weekly, which is rejected up. Okay, it's not really that strong. And then we have to look at the daily. And you'll notice the problem for a swing trader or the problem for a larger trader is that we still haven't taken out 79. So 79 will, I believe, be a very big pivotal point here for oil and it's currently at resistance. So maybe a little bit of weakness here if it keeps strengthening through, it goes through 79, pullback should be met with bull demand at that point. Now we mentioned that 10 cents coming this week, that Alibaba's coming this week. So that means that Chinese stocks are in focus for the first time in a little while. We know that we need a 377 10 cent. We haven't got it yet. If we get a 377 plus, that's very bullish. And the HSI also is told us what we wanna see. That's why we're patient and we react. So. Why I mean by this is, okay, yes, we now have an island reversal, a gap down, consolidation gap up, but we also rejected the 20 moving average. So we know that this is our higher high, this is a rejection week, this is an island reversal. If we now breach to the upside with some positive catalyst being the news, and we don't know that yet, that's the one thing we don't know, that's probably a pretty good sign that we're going to see follow through. Excited for HSI this week, certainly looking at it, we'll, we'll keep watching it together. Semiconductors, 200, that's where we knew we'd find a buy. Uh, well, we had a good suspicion anyway. It's done okay, 11.86. You might say, well, that's a crazy result. It's okay. Uh, it should have done a little bit better, in my opinion, because we should already be back at 229. So semis are actually lagging here a little bit in terms of the recovery they should be seeing. NVIDIA did better. It managed to get back to the gap, gave us a beautiful trade on Thursday towards the long end, but it needs to get through these areas to pull the market up to the key zones. Some things to watch, daily 20, which is this blue line here, 112. And of course, if we're able to get up somewhere around 117, we'll also need to be watched from bear bust areas. That's where bears could come back in. Tesla consolidating, bulls, you know what you want. You got an island reversal here, but there's a big difference between getting one in the middle of nowhere and getting one in clear demand. If this thing gaps up and does well, it's going to do, I think, quite nicely. Stops below the low in that case. And you'll notice here we've got these weak rejections around 203. So Tesla has been worse than the market. There's no doubt it's been worse than the market. And it could find momentum because remember 205, 200 are both massive call zones. So that positive gamma shift could easily get the market up to 230. Excited to watch Tesla this week. Remember, I might be a little bit negative on it in terms of the next couple of earnings, but that doesn't change what a trader will do. A trader will look at it as an opportunity if it comes up. And I thought that was a good learning curve. If, even if you have a negative bias on something, that doesn't really matter because your opinion means nothing. Mine doesn't either. <laughs> what we're doing is we're watching the flow. TA, data, flows. The three, the three kind of pillars of my trading and investing journey. And I'm guessing a lot of yours out there as well. US 2000, what have we got going on here? We have a market that's touched the most traded zone, a market that's found recovery, it is weaker than the S&P and the NASDAQ because it should already be testing this zone of 2100 again, uh, but that's to be expected. The Russell has got a lot of trash in it as well, so that's going to struggle this week. 
Now, if we break through that level, of course, all markets will rise together to the gap fills. And the Dow is the same. Look how horrible that came in on Thursday. Terrible looking candles. Big tweezer down, looks terrible. Rejects it, doji now. Clearly a point of indecision. Again, we breached through on the S&P. Every market you would think will rise and uh, including the Dow at that point. Let's have a look at the NASDAQ. Excellent trade again. Very, very nice this week. Did find a little bit of strength. Ended up as a doji. And all of these markets are linking, guys. They're all linked. We've got anchored VWAPs. We've got trend lines. We've got markets moving up to these points here around 18,900 to 19,000. And guess what that all links with? 54.40. So if this market does end up finding bulls, then that's where it's probably going to go. I guess on the bear side, it would have to bust around here and find structure towards the sell F off. And at that point, you'd have to say 17,700, where we found those buyers before, would be the next level of support. Probably what I would expect is it would come down, weaken off against that, and then do something like this. But if it does come back down like that, more than likely, I think we're getting a new low. So stuff to watch. There's always two sides to the to the cause, but in this case, I think it's more presenting towards the bull end. Now, Bitcoin was a little bit more bullish. So it was a little bit stronger on the charts. You can see here that the market managed to get to a 61.8 uh, retracement. It found some sellers, not super sold off, but this is where you would expect weakness. And then, of course, hopefully strength. So Bitcoin, it's at the weakness zone. Let's revisit this once we actually get some form of movement. Now, for a day trader, for someone that's trying to get into a to a bit of a sell on Bitcoin. I probably wouldn't even attack a sell here unless it got under this zone, which is clearly a bit of an order block. And if the market is going like high and then goes underneath it, that would also be quite weak. So yeah, I think I'd wait for more to really be heavily short on Bitcoin around these levels. If you nailed 62, well done for you. Uh, otherwise, we have to watch and, and see. And it looks like even just checking out this small time frame here, that we might even have some kind of weird trend line forming off the base as well. So let's move over to the news. And there are a couple of big events happening this week outside of just the earnings. And of course, earnings being focused more on China. But in this case, we've got core PPI Tuesday coming out 8.30 a.m. Then we've got core CPI at 8.30 a.m., the favorite figure of everybody. And then the last one down here is core retail sales. Lots of cores coming out. As we know, the CPI event will be the biggest. We'll get the JP Morgan game plan to see what they have to say. But ultimately, it's going to be patience, react, don't predict. Sure to be volatile, sure to be quite a lot of movements to the yield curve. And that means that if you can follow us over on X, I think it'll be a great week to do so. So definitely do that. Check us out in terms of some of the courses we've got. And if you want to find out more about the replication, some of the excellent trades we had this week, then you can really check out that day trading masterclass. I think you'll enjoy that or the advanced one if you want to know more about investing, swing trading, cyclical processes, and why we think this thing is late cycle and what to do about it. All right. Thank you so much. Have a great weekend. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you on Monday and probably we'll get a second video out as well to discuss what is going on with these markets right now. Bye, guys.